Stanley Spencer, who lived from 1891 to 1959, uh, trained uh, at the Slade when drawing and clarity of line was uh, emphasized. And I think you can see in that picture uh, called Silent Painting, called Silent Prayer, uh, you can see something of that uh, clarity of line and the skill of his drawing <coughs> which remained with him uh, all his life. One of the uh, features uh, of his life and paintings was that he had a very, very happy, secure uh, childhood and this is reflected in his uh, paintings. Um, and you can see here is the, is the family gathered around in a kind of cosy, comfortable way in a family uh, sitting room. Now, unfortunately, this uh, painting also reveals a very unhappy period in his life uh, when he became uh, obsessed with a lady called Patricia uh, Priest, uh, divorced his wife Hilda, uh, but then after that, always tried to, as it were, reclaim her imaginatively in his pictures. Uh, and here uh, you will see, um, I hope, oh yes, there we are. There you can see one picture of Hilda, Hilda his wife, uh, who wasn't living with him at the time, uh, there snoozing in a wicker chair. But down here, uh, there's another picture uh, of, of Hilda. Uh, sitting, drawing with her arms crossed. So this was a time uh, when he was trying to, as it were, reclaim her uh, imaginatively, uh, but it's, as it were, integrated uh, into, his, into his happy, uh, cosy uh, childhood. So there you can see that sort of close-up one uh, of uh, Hilda there. And there's Hilda in the uh, close-up of the in the armchair. Now he made his living by selling paintings of scenes around Cookham. Uh, they were very popular uh, and it was this that enabled him uh, to live. Here is a typical kind of Cookham scene with the scarecrow. There's Cookham Moor. Uh, there is a, a house at Cookham uh, with some uh, wonderful foliage, the lilac out. Uh, there is a painting uh, flower scene. Now I mentioned uh, that he had this cosy, secure childhood which was reflected in so many uh, of his uh, paintings. Uh, and he pa although he painted biblical scenes throughout his life, he painted them in a very unusual kind of oblique way which very often drew on his uh, childhood experience. I mean, looking at that without the title, The Centurion Servant, I don't think you would have recognized that as a painting, The Secure Centurion Servant. What he's painted, actually, uh, is his, uh, are the, his childhood scene of people kneeling in prayer at the foot of the bed, uh, but side of the bed, a sort of a comfortable young Stanley Spencer in the bed. Uh, and this is, as it were, a, a scene outside uh, the main uh, miracle of the centurion's servant. Now he saw beauty in unusual places. <laughs> and this is one of the great strengths of Stanley uh, Spencer. Um, and uh, the, uh, this painting, when I first looked at it, it does sound one rather, seem rather strange. Actually, uh, it's a very... <laughs> It's very, very wonderful. Uh, underneath, you can see there's a, little, there's a little sort of Stanley Spencer there, sort of pulling something out of a drawer uh, with this great lady up there above him. Now, not only did he see beauty uh, in unusual places, this beauty usually had a strong sensual element, and there's a sensual element uh, in, even in that picture uh, there. Uh, but, and we'll see a little bit more of that later on. But he not only saw a beauty in unusual places, he saw the holy in unusual places. Um, this is based upon a little bit of village mythology in Cookham, 
where it was, it was said that Sarah Tubb, uh, uh, when she had seen Haley's comet, uh, simply knelt down in the street uh, to pray because she'd taken it as an end of the world. So here we have Cookham High Street. The children play marbles or sprawl around. An old man looks at his bag of empty beer bottles and interspersed between them are angels also observing the marbles or the beer bottles or just sitting around in the sun. Heaven is on earth and earth is taken up into heaven. And I think uh, we get a clue to this painting and to so many of Stanley Spentis' paintings in some words which he himself wrote. He said, When I lived in Cookham, I was disturbed by a feeling of everything being meaningless. Quite suddenly I became aware that everything was full of special meaning and this made everything holy. The instinct of Moses to take his shoes off when he saw the burning bush was very similar to my feelings. I saw many burning bushes in Cookham. I observed the sacred quality in the most unexpected places. So here is villagers and, and saints. Uh, sorry, I was talking about, that was the Sarah Tubb one. I meant to talk about, uh, about uh, this one, which is villagers and saints. If you look there, uh, you can see uh, the boy playing marbles there. You can see the old man up here with his beer bottles. You can see the, the angels with their wings around and sort of bystanders, the holy in uh, the middle of Cookham High Street. As I say, he painted biblical scenes throughout his life. Here's the marriage at Cana, uh, a slightly unusual depiction of that particular parable. Uh, and you can see what I mean about a strong sensual element. I mean, who else would have thought of painting uh, a scene like that, you know, the man pulling back the chair for uh, the bride to sit down on and her, as it were, making herself sort of comfortable and secure at the back. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you can see the very strong sensual element in here. This is another one. This is the bridesmaids at Cana. Look at those wonderful legs. Now this is a very famous painting, Christ preaching at Cookham Regatta. Uh, here all is crowds and jollity. The man in the front is carrying mops and assorted, assorted boat gear, uh, practical tasks to be done, which were always important to Stanley. And Christ sits in a wicker chair on the ferry, ferry a little way uh, from the uh, shore. Uh, behind the ferry is a row of punts, and it's a picture based on the scene in Mark chapter 4 where it is recorded that the crowds were so great that Christ got into a boat where he sat and from which he talked and the crowd gathered at the water's edge. Here Christ has bare feet, a long coat and hat like a Hasidim but sitting in a basket chair leaning forward with such excitement that he has to hold himself in his chair to stop himself falling forward. And children and little people are in the ferry and the scene took him back to his youth when literally thousands of people came down from London to join locals in the exuberance of the regatta. And to Stanley, the regatta, regatta was a symbol of the fulfilment of everybody's wishes. This is what he wrote about this painting. If it is carnal wishes, they will be fulfilled. If it is creative wishes, they will be fulfilled. If it is sexual desires or picture-making inspiration that is to be satisfied, then Christ will have the capstan round. All will be met. Everything will be fulfilled in the symbol of the regatta, the complete worshipfulness and lovableness of everything to do with love is meant in this regatta scene. So let's just look at one or two of those a bit uh, close up. There you can see uh, Christ in the wicker chair dressed as a Hasidim and the uh, little uh, children in the ferry which he said are, little, are like little frogs which have jumped accidentally into punts from the river bank. Here is another one of his uh, uh, biblical scenes, the Last Supper, uh, based upon uh, an old malt house in uh, Cookham.
And here is Christ's entry into Jerusalem, again based uh, on Kokum. This is Christ's arrest, again based uh, on uh, Kokum. This has a, a particular, had a particular resonance uh, for Stanley Spencer. There is Christ sort of being hauled along. Uh, but this figure here apparently is a portrait of Sir Alfred Munnings who rejected, who was president of the Royal Academy, who rejected uh, Stanley Spencer's paintings for the, uh, for the summer show. So Stanley Spencer got his own back. And here is the Daughters of, of Jerusalem, again another uh, Holy Week scene set in uh, Cookham. And here is Christ carrying the cross. And this picture, painted in 1920s in the Tate Gallery, the light seems to come from high up on the right as we look. The men on the bottom left are shielding their faces from it. And the light casts strong shadows on the houses from the people. The light seems pale, almost unearthly. The sky isn't a bright blue. It's, is it moonlight or early mor morning light? And the colours, too, are interesting with their subdued pastel shades. The people are looking out of the windows. The net curtains are blowing out rather like angels' wings as the people look all about. And the presence of the ladders derives from what actually happened when Stanley Spencer was working on this composition. He saw workmen carrying ladders across the houses and this provided, as he put it, the reality of everyday life and enabled him to locate the Via Crucis in Cookham High Street. And the ladders are a visual echo of the shape of the cross. Women with doll-like faces are by the railings which are in the shape of sharp spears suggesting violence and Christ himself is hidden under the cross whilst men with caps, perhaps bricklayers with hods, and a slight sense of Ku Klux Klan menace. Overall, there's a sense of people being out and about and busy, with the procession to the crucifixion hardly noticed, lost amidst ordinary everyday things. Yet it's the, the light that indicates there's something strange taking place. Perhaps it's one of those shafts of light that you get sometimes just before or after a storm. Now, the Tate Gallery originally mistitled this picture Christ Bearing His Cross, which intensely irritated Stanley Spencer. As he said, the false title implied a sense of suffering which was not my intention. I particularly wish to convey the relationship between the carpenters behind him carrying the ladders and Christ in front carrying the cross, each doing their job of work and doing it just like workmen. Christ was not doing a job, or his job, but the job. Again, when Stanley Spencer's dealer thought of cataloguing the painting as Christ bearing his cross, Stanley was furious. The cross for him was universal. We all have to carry the cross. Here is a crucifixion in the... Uh, middle of Cookham High Street, a great pile of a builder sand there uh, with Mary spread eagled on the builder's, builder's sand. Uh, two horrific uh, people banging in nails, sense of horror on the face of one of the thieves being crucified behind, beside him. Christ, as it were, looking up to heaven uh, and a boy looking down from there and people looking out from their windows in Hookham High Street. Uh, this was the last pe major painting by Stanley Spencer before his death in 1959, and it was painted for the chapel of a school funded by brewers, hence the brewer's cap uh, on the men nailing Christ to the cross. And as you can understand, the painting caused a public outcry. And when Stanley Spencer went down to talk to the school about the meaning of the painting, his remarks would hardly have helped. He told the boys, it's your governors and you who are still nailing Christ to the cross. <laughs> so 
So there you have these extraordinary vivid faces of the brewer's men with those nails in their mouths and the hammers and the look of horror and anguish on the face of the thief being crucified beside him. And those are the women looking out of their, their windows. Now here's another very famous painting. Um, the Resurrection in Cookham Churchyard. And resurrection was a, a theme which preoccupied Stanley. It's not only this famous resurrection in Cookham Churchyard, but as we will see later on, the resurrection of soldiers in the Sander Memorial Chapel and the Port Glasgow resurrection and another resurrection reunion now at Aberdeen. And everything in this picture has personal significance. Stanley is lying on the tomb at the bottom right. Hilda is shown a number of times, each representing a luminous moment, a sudden flash of awareness which lifted his spirit in joy. As Stanley himself wrote, no one is in any hurry in this painting. Here and there things slowly move off, but in the main they're resurrected to such a state of joy that they're content and happy to remain where they've resurrected. In this life we experience a kind of resurrection when we arrive at a state of awareness, a state of being in love. And at such times we like to do again what we've done so many times in the past. And so over there, Hilda mooches over a, a, a stile somewhere over here. Um, she wears a favourite dress of hers. People read their own he he headstones. And by the ivy-coloured church tower, uh, a man, uh, a, a, a wife brushes the earth and grass off her husband. Another buttons a coat up and another straightens a man's collar. Further down you see Hilda smelling flowers and each part of the picture, the meaning of the resurrection is conveyed by, people, bring, by bringing people into contact with their customary surroundings. To emphasize the place and bare fact of myself, he said, I've thought of an open book and when you read a book you settle down to it and this is me settling down between two lids of the tomb. This is my signature to the painting. It's a very complicated picture to see and, and read that. And even uh, seeing the, the, uh, the real painting, it's not altogether easy to see all the details. And, uh, but you can, I think you can get the general uh, idea of it. There, there's, a, there's Stanley Spencer himself, you see, resurrecting resurrect from the dead. Uh, two figures poking up from the, their tomb there, looking quizzically around. Two people over here waking up from their tomb and having a little chat to one one another. Lady there sniffing the flowers, no, reading her own tombstone. It's full of little personal details. These are sort of prophets uh, by the wall of the church. And this very strange scene right here Now, Stanley Spencer, after a long, after a long period of agonizing, joined the REMC, uh, serving first of all as a hospital orderly, uh, then in Macedonia, and then with the Royal Berkshires. And this is reflected in a painting he did for the War Artists Commission uh, called uh, Travois uh, Arriving at a Dressing Station at Samol, S-M-O-L, in Macedonia, but especially in the Sander Memorial Chapel, which we, we will be looking at uh, in a moment. Uh, but partly as a result of that uh, experience, uh, he depicted this crucifixion, which is in Aberdeen. It was commissioned for a village hall war memorial, which eventually fell through, and it depicts Macedonian topography and Mediterranean clarity of light. 
uh, and the composition is scattered with a soldier on the left with a spear and robe, which he's won in the lottery, and on the right at the bottom is the centurion. Middle right are the spectators shaking their heads. The force of the imagery lies in the experience in the Vardar Hills in Macedonia, which Stanley saw in 1918. He saw three ravines standing out in the snow, quotes like three spear wounds. They did not make him think of the crucifixion, nor did he simply use the imagery in an illustrative way. His experience was both of the worst that lay ahead and yet of very great hope. As he walked along there, he said, I suddenly had a feeling of the completeness and fitness and ultimate redemption of everything. I felt I was a walking altar of praise. And the worst experience which lay ahead are expressed in the distorted composition, very different from a sort of camera view of the plane. Now the picture can, of course, also be given a Freudian interpretation. But Stanley was fully aware of this. He wrote some very revealing words. I start off in the direction of vision and am drawn towards secular wishes and desires. In expressing them, I come across a religious feeling as if by accident and not ready for it. I'm able, unable to express it as, I should, as it should be expressed and realized. Conversely, if I start off in the same vision way, trying literally to find this real religious something, I achieve ordinary uninspired secular feelings like in landscapes. The element I want in the religious picture I find in secular and in secular love and feeling and the secular element I don't like or, or want I find when I do a religious picture that is minus the sex element. So and that's all a bit convoluted but I think you can guess more or less what he means. <laughs> that's when he's sort of hyped up with this sort of clearly very intense emotion that he felt about things which was presumably partly sexual, partly mystical. It was then... Uh, that his best religious paintings came. But he set out, if he set out to do a religious painting, the result was something rather flat and in, uninspired. I think that's what he's really trying to say there. Now, as I said, uh, he, he, he had this experience in the First World War, uh, but during the First World War, uh, he celebrates uh, the ordinary activities of soldiers uh, and in the Sandham Memorial Chapel uh, there are uh, many little vignettes of soldiers doing different things. Uh, here soldiers washing, here is Ravelli, here are ablutions, Here's kit inspection. Here's map reading. The point is that he celebrated and rejoiced in all these ordinary activities of soldiers or anybody else. Convoy of wounded men filling water bottles. Now what... It's also particularly remarkable is uh, he's such a contrast to the First World War poets. Poets like Wilfred Owen have shaped our whole attitude to war. We see the First World War as one of those grievous and terrible events in human history, full of human suffering and agony. Yet the extraordinary thing about Stanley Spencer, uh, he just saw the, the rejoicing in ordinary things. Uh, for instance, this convoy of wounded soldiers arriving at Beaufort Hospital Gates where he was acting as an orderly. I mean, they're arriving as though they're arriving for a wedding. Look at those sort of flowers there, everybody sitting on top, looking quite cheerful. And in the hospital, he celebrated all these ordinary activities. Bed making, for example. Loved it. But above all, in Sandham Memorial Chapel, uh, there is this painting of the resurrection of the, of the soldiers. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail, because again, this is very difficult to, necessary to see. Uh, up here is a tiny figure of 
Christ, uh, receiving the soldiers' crosses. Here is a little figure of Stanley Spencer between a collapsed a mule train, uh, which he said was based on one of his sort of experiences at Hampstead Heath when he was younger. Here are the soldiers uh, rising to new life, but what do they do in the resurrection life? They recently get down to their ordinary everyday tasks. This man is probably polishing his belt. The Sander Memorial Chapel was commissioned by Mr. and Mrs. Berend in memory of their son who died in Macedonia and it's reminiscent of the Arena Chapel in Padua by Giotto which was always a great inspiration to Stanley Spencer. And Christ uh, is there uh, in this picture not as a judge uh, as he is in most uh, Renaissance and medieval paintings as it was in Giotto but as a compassionate receiver of the soldiers' crosses. Sandy Spencer said about all these ordinary physical tasks, however mundane, they were part of the glory of things, providing their spiritual meaning can be discerned. As he put it, referring to his time in the hospital, I didn't despise any job I was set to do and didn't mind doing anything as long as I could recognize in it some sort of integral connection with a spiritual meaning that demanded to be clarified. And he was much influenced in his attitude to work by some words of St. Augustine about God being always at work and always at rest, which he thought of as God always fetching and carrying, but with an inner serenity. So the soldiers are rising to, from the dead on the battlefield, uh, but immediately getting down to their old tasks. There is a detail of that painting. Stanley Spencer on the flattened uh, mule cart uh, looking at a cross. Uh, behind is the little figure of Christ receiving the soldiers' crosses. And there is that soldier getting down to his ordinary everyday duties, polishing buttons and cleaning. And there is a close-up of Stanley Spencer again on a childhood reminiscence, as it were, sleeping between two mules. Now in the Second World War, Stanley was sent as a war office, uh, by the war office, to be a war of artist uh, to uh, Port Glasgow on the Clyde, about 15 miles down uh, the river from Glasgow itself. And he was fascinated by the communal life of the city. He said, I liked it here, being lost in the jungle of human beings, a rabbit in a vast rabbit warren. So there is the Clyde. There's a typical furnace man that he saw. And he painted uh, this, he, paint, had, he had what he called hand holders from time to time and this uh, lady uh, was one who helped him for some time when he was up there. Very fine portrait painter he was of course. But the great work, and it's the two, two aspects of the great work from his time in Glasgow, uh, the first were his studies uh, of work. He was fascinated by the process of production, the shipbuilding, um, and he uh, wanted to uh, do this huge, huge series of paintings, uh, which you can see uh, this is what he had in mind. Uh, a pa huge painting of the burners, the riggers, the plumbers, the riveters, bending the keel, the welders, and the template. The template was meant to run all the way bottom and that wasn't quite uh, finished. But this is how he originally conceived it. Uh, here uh, is, I th here is, is, is one uh, in, not, in, in a sort of panoramic view. Um, 
but seeing them up in detail is, is more fun. Now he said um, about going into these uh, factories to see these ships being built, uh, I was as disinclined to disturb them as I would disturb a church service. He did preliminary sketches of all these on a roll of lab lavatory paper and apparently he had a sort of party piece. He would suddenly unwield, un unroll this great roll of lavatory paper. To, to, uh, they, they were finished off at a studio in Epson. They were very well received at the time, both in London and New York. And one of the excitements is uh, there's not been able to see these pictures for many years, most of them, and they've been restored. But this summer it will be possible to see three of these restored paintings at the Stanley Spencer Gallery in Cookham. I certainly intend to go and see them myself. I don't think there's ever been such a, a wonderful depiction of, of work myself. I think these paintings are absolutely fabulous. Now we come to a no less wonderful series, Christ in the Wilderness. Um, some of these paintings, most of them, were painted in 1939 to 40 a time of great personal unhappiness, the breakup of his marriage, breakup of the relationship with Patricia Priest, who lived on his own in Swiss Cottage. But extraordinary, it was also a time of great spiritual awareness for him. As he said, I felt there was something wonderful in the life I was living. I loved it all because it was God and me all the time. Now, these great paintings are not easily accessible because they're in the gallery uh, of Western Austra Australia in Perth. They're all based upon scenes in the uh, Bible, in the New Testament, uh, connected either directly with the temptations in the wilderness or they have an integral relationship uh, to that. Christ in the wilderness, driven by the Spirit, you can really feel him driven by the wind there. Christ in the wilderness, the foxes have holes. Wonderful way in which they... Fox is peering out of the peer, fox is peering out of the holes, and Christ is, as it were, arms akimbo, holding them. Rising from sleep like a, a flower opening up to the sun, based on a bomb crater in Swiss Cottage. Another one of these paintings, reminiscent of Stanley Spencer's childhood, uh, kneeling by the bed with his hands together in prayer on a pillow. This cosy, secure feeling. Consider the lilies where Christ is actually down on the ground sniffing them.
darker painting based on a saying of Jesus where the carcass is there will the vultures gather. I think based on the saying of Christ that as a hen longs to gather her chicks under her arm so have I longed to gather you uh, to me, O people of Jerusalem. And if I had to choose one of Stanley Spencer's religious paintings, this would be the one. Christ is holding a scorpion in his hand and looking down with such extraordinary tenderness and pity. We now come to the Port Glasgow Resurrection series. I told you there were two great sets of paintings from Glasgow, one on work and one on the resurrection. Um, but before we get uh, to that, this is a kind of uh, link. I can't uh, resist the temptation to mention it because it's a, a personal link. When I was a curate in Hampstead, uh, there was a very creative lady called Daphne Charlton who I always used to meet out in the streets and used to, she used to talk non-stop uh, in the most creative kind of way most, used to write in the most creative kind of way incredibly creative she herself was an artist and actually did a lovely portrait of our son as a young, as a young boy and I'll never forget once when I was walking past a hospital in Hampstead she suddenly sort of buttonholed me in the street and apropos nothing at all said rather sort of strongly and fiercely Christ didn't go around sympathising with the sick he said take up your pallet and walk you know this, this was the kind of thing you got from her in the most, anyway that, she, he, she was another of the handholders at the time of great unhappiness uh, in his life uh, and um, that portrait is in, the, uh, in Tate Britain but, as I say, at Glasgow, this is the cemetery, and this cemetery uh, had a great deal of meaning for Stanley Spencer. After describing the vivid life of the city, he wrote about it, that it seemed to me full of some inward surging meaning, a kind of joy that I longed to get closer to and understand to in some way fulfil. And I felt that all this life and meaning was somehow grouped around and in some way led up to the cemetery on the hill outside the town. And I began to see the Port Glasgow resurrection that I have drawn and painted for the last five years. I seemed to see that it rose in the midst of a great place and that all the planes were resurrecting and moving towards it. I knew that the resurrection would be directed from the hill. So here we have a very ordinary looking cemetery which inspired that with this tiny, tiny little slope there. And here, this, he imagined the sort of resurrection at the end of time happening uh, here. And from that came from paintings like, uh, like this. The angels of the apocalypse, very, very benign angels, scattering seeds from their files there. The Hill of Zion. This is what he said about the Hill of Zion. As it has worked out, this hillside cemetery has become the Hill of Zion, where Christ, seated in the top center, directs the prophets, angels, and disciples at the resurrection. Among the lilac here is a standing prophet scanning the country, and by him a trumpeting angel, a recording angel with a scroll as above, and a second trumpeting angel on the other side. One of the disciples squats and hugs his ankles, uh, beyond the left slope of the hill, some girls lead a chain of children climbing from the plain. And beyond, on the right side, there are resurrected men and, uh, and women. This is just a bit of the right. We'll look at the rest uh, in a minute. Uh, but, you see, there, uh, there's a, there is Christ, a bit of Christ resurrecting. Uh, there's somebody, looks as though they're uh, 
looking at a bit of a, a, a scroll there, resurrected people up here, people rising from their graves there, trumpeter. A woman looks as though she's tidying up her hair, other people looking thoughtful as they wake from the dead. There are people lifting up their gravestone in order to climb out. Meanwhile, other people here having got out are just sort of resting quietly and observing the scene, sort of total sort of peace of mind. Here's this wonderful one of waking up. Imagine waking up on resurrection morning like that with that huge yawn and rubbing their eyes. Now one of the features of uh, this series of paintings is uh, that as well as showing the resurrection of the dead, it's sort of related to what people do in graveyards anyway, particularly tidying. So there's several sort of scenes related to tidying up. There's a man sort of tidying up, scraping the leaves. Here's the reunion. And he wrote all sorts of really fascinating things about, about these paintings. Um, he wanted to uh, convey... Uh, the sense of each gro grave as a sort of part of a person's home. In that earlier one of he wanted to convey also in that particular one uh, of people looking in different ways. This is painting, we particularly wanted to show the different kinds of looks that people give each other. If you look at, at, at uh, up here, the look there, um, uh, the looks sort of here, there, all sorts of different kinds of looks as people rose from the dead. That's what fascinated him in that one. Now the intensity of Stanley Spencer's uh, feelings uh, can be gauged by a, a remark he once made about his friends, uh, the Slessers. He says, I remember having some friends I was always meeting in the evenings and I didn't see anything special about them until one day I went to have breakfast with them and seeing them at breakfast gave me a wonderful feelings about them. I was so overcome that I couldn't eat my breakfast, not even bread and butter. And that seems to me an extraordinary remark and extraordinarily revealing about the intensity uh, of the way he responded to life. I mean, imagine going to a breakfast with somebody and suddenly being so struck by, as it were, the otherness, the holiness the sheer isness of the other people at breakfast table, that he himself couldn't eat anything more. He was over, so overcome with this, with this strong sense of emotion. Um, and I think that extraordinary strength of, a, of, of emotion uh, comes uh, in all his uh, paintings.
And this extraordinary feeling of emotion he had, uh, where, which was perhaps expressed above all, uh, well, no, not just above all, but expressed in everything, in the way he focused on the, the unusual, he saw in the unusual something interesting, something attractive, something holy, uh, in the way uh, that people were resurrected uh, to their ordinary life, they were quite content to be where they were, um, as it were, utterly, blissfully, peacefully happy. Uh, because for him, uh, whatever he did or did not believe about the, uh, the afterlife, and we don't know what he believed about the afterlife, what he tried to convey uh, was the sense that we're, we're resurrected in this life into seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary uh, and the holy in the, in the mundane. And if there is uh, one other quotation from his writings which brings this home, it's this. He says, Love is the essential power in the creation of art. And love is not a talent. Love reveals and more accurately describes the nature and meaning of things than any mere lecture on technique can do. And it establishes once and for all time the final and perfect identity uh, of every created thing. So this love not only establishes the identity of every created thing, but raises that thing into a harmonious relationship with all other things and people. And if we believe with Thomas Aquinas that grace doesn't destroy but fulfill nature, then in Stanley Stenders' paintings we see grace at work on our disfigured world transforming human relationships into a holy communion of the divine and the human, the divine expressed in and through the human, the spiritual in and through the physical, the holy in and through the mundane, the beautiful in and through what sometimes strikes us in his pictures as the ungainly or ugly. For all was embraced in his vision and raised into heaven here and now. I think at that point I will open up for some questions, lights, Thank you all. So who would uh, like to uh, begin? There's a lady. Um, um, well, some are held by uh, the uh, War Museum, but whether the, whether the ones, uh, or, or whether they're ones that were stored away at the bottom of the Tate, I'm not sure which, which ones yet. And perhaps this is a point to say uh, that uh, if you're slightest bit interested in Cook in Stanley Spencer, there's two things not to be missed. Uh, one, as I've already mentioned, is the Cookham Gallery in, in Cookham, uh, which has that Last Supper, uh, it has the Christ preaching at Cookham Regatta and lots of other studies. And as I said, this summer, uh, some of those wonderful Glasgow work scenes. The other place not to be missed, as I suggested earlier, Sander Memorial Chapel, uh, which is just south of, of Newbury. Um, you need to go there in daylight because they don't have uh, electric light there quite de deliberately. Uh, so those are the two places really not to be missed. Um, Nick, there's a, there's a gentleman right at the back there. In the um, detail, one of the detailed um, enlargements of the resurrection in Cookham Churchyard, you pointed to what you called a strange scene. Yes. And I just wondered if there are any hints as to what it's a scene of. Yes, I was trying, trying to rack my brain exactly what it is. It's that it doesn't fit into any ordinary iconography. Um, that's, that's the trouble. Well, first of all, you can, see, uh, you can see that scene from a distance, you see, under the, under the, uh, in the porch of the church. And then uh, you can see it there as you look at it uh, up, up here. It seems to be... I mean, the, the, the odd thing is that... Um, uh, I, 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 th there's a baby there, you see. So that may be, that may be Mary uh, or mother cuddling a child, but, but they, even the sexes of the people is a bit um, am ambiguous. 
and whether that's a, a Stanley Spencer there. Um, but it's, 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 it's a bit confusing, that. That's all I can say. I've never been totally convinced by, what, by the explanations that I've read of it. Bishop, surely many of us would agree with you when you say that uh, Sandham and Cookham are not to be missed. But sadly, um, few of us will ever get to Perth in Western Australia. Yes. I wonder whether you think that uh, people of influence, with, uh, without mentioning names, might be prevailed upon to ask Perth to let us have the pictures for an exhibition here. Yes. Um, that's, uh, in fact, they did come to London about 20 years ago because I saw them in, in London myself and it was, it was absolutely staggering. Now, funny enough, when I went to Perth, they weren't in Perth, they were on exhibition somewhere else. <laughs> but no, uh, I think I will suggest that to somebody. It would be wonderful to have those in this country because they have become better known uh, and uh, as you, you, rec you know they are so yeah. and a supplementary if I may just for your information you might be pleased to know that new entry army chaplains go to Sandham Memorial Chapel as part of their initial training right <laughs> that's very interesting yes Um, while you've got the, the resurrection on the screen, um, yes. there's a couple of things. First of all, um, that's his father at the back there with the music, church organist. Oh, yes, that's right. Well mm. done. I'll show that. And, that's uh, his, his father. Yes, there's that's his, right. Yes. There's his yes. father. You're quite right. His father was a great <coughs> uh, musician, as you will know better than I do. Um, and... Uh, it was a, clearly a very, very happy childhood where there was not only talking all the time, but music making all the time. Yeah, and the other um, point? And um, there's an anecdote that people might be interested in. Um, my <coughs> husband's aunt is Stanley's cousin, or was Stanley's cousin, and she um, told me the story about the resurrection, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that a number of the people coming out, up out of their tombs are villagers and some of them are villagers who are having affairs with other villagers who come <laughs> at, up as a couple and her comment was um, caused a bit of trouble in the village <laughs> so um, I couldn't see who that was was speaking actually was it was it unity no because no, I believe that Unity is here. Lovely to, lovely to have you here. Yes, let's have a, a little bit more uh, detail of that church porch, please. Unity would just like um, me to say that the figures in the church porch are God the Father at the back with his arms um, around the seated figure who is Christ with, who is holding the babies. But why, 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 what I've never been able to understand is why Christ is holding the baby. Well, Ken, Ken Popel has written a very good book, as you probably know. I do, I do know the book, And yes. he's described this very carefully and very interestingly. Yes, yes. So I suggest anybody who's interested is, yeah, it would, is a good book. would like to, do, to read it. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Giotto and uh, Padua, and um, I wondered whether uh, in his journeys um, he would have um, visited uh, 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 Notre Dame des Fontaines, which is a very small church um, uh, well north of Nice, uh, which a guy called, if I remember rightly, um, Canavesio um, painted. Um, in the end of the uh, 1480s, 1490s, a most remarkable um, building um, with um, uh, murals all over the walls, I mean, completely covered, done before the Sistine Chapel was uh, painted. Uh, um, but the most interesting thing, the reason for my mentioning it, is that um, the uh, scene of Christ's resurrection um, looks remarkably like um, the opening of the tombs in Cookham Churchyard. And I wondered whether uh, he ever visited um, Notre Dame de Fontaine up near Tende, uh, uh, just near the Italian border. 
and I whether he was influenced so by I that. Know, he didn't, I don't think he could have done. He really didn't do much tra traveling. He didn't do much traveling from Cookham, so far as I know. I can be put right on that, but uh, I've never thought of him as a great traveler. Uh, mind you, you just remind me of something totally unconnected, but <laughs> Winston Churchill apparently looked at this and similar resurrection uh, paintings and <laughs> remarked once in his characteristic way, well, if that's the resurrection of the dead, give me eternal sleep. <laughs> Um, I hate to correct you, Bishop, but first of all, the Sand Memorial Chapel is actually Mary's brother, Harry Willoughby, not her son. Mary was Mary Sandham before what, she I became... Say? Right. Um, what you didn't mention about the chapel is the tremendous sense of triangularity that there are lots and lots of visual triangles in every picture and the whole thing is a, a sort of triple level there's um, on the predellas at the bottom there's Stanley's experience at the lunatic asylum that became the Beaufort hospital and on the sort of main curved pictures there's the his experience in the Macedonian campaign and at, right at the top there's the pictures of camps but there's this tremendous underlying three part father son and holy spirit the whole time in his mm. in all his paintings really there's this three part expression of everyday life spiritual life and god and it's it it came through in your lecture so well that this is this is really the ideal way to live, mm. that it's doing everything as if, and he yeah. described scrubbing the floors in the hospital mm. as doing it, as if he was doing it yeah. to go to heaven. Yeah. It's so yeah. moving, and you, yeah. you brought that out so well. Well, th yes, I mean, thank you for drawing my attention to the triangular configuration in the Santa Memorial Chapel, which I hadn't... Uh, it hadn't occurred to me before, but next time I go there, I will certainly look out for that. Thank you. How are we... Do, any more... Prob have we got time for one more... We've got time for one more question, if people have got another. Or any more questions? Or we, I think, looks as though... Was there any more? Oh, sorry, there's one there. Yes, yeah, sorry. Well, it's not a question, actually, but if... If anyone's going to visit a National Trust property called Cliveden, which is near Cookham, yes. they will see two amazing Stanley Spencers in, in the sort of vestibule as you enter the house. From memory, I think they might even be mosaics. I can't quite remember, but they are called Listening from the Punts, something like that, to Christ preaching. At right, Cookham. thank you. Thank you very much. So anyway, uh, thank you very much for your attendance at this course of uh, lectures. Um, I'll be starting again in October. You've got the summer off. Um, <laughs> um, and the next year, because clearly uh, art is, you know, people like art, I'm going to do something next year on Christian faith and modern art. I'm defining modern as beginning with the German expressionists. And really the background of this, given the extraordinary revolutionary change in artistic styles in the 20th century, um, what, how did painters and artists who wanted to express Christian themes and use Christian iconography, how did they do so with all these extraordinary revolutionary changes, some of which, of course, as we know, are very un inhospitable to any kind of traditional uh, iconography. So that's the kind of challenge that I'm giving myself and you next uh, year. <laughs> so see you then perhaps. Thank you.